I'm Morgan. I go to UT in Austin right now. I was just wondering, you mentioned biodiversity at the end with coral reefs, and I feel like that's what I've heard is almost like the worst impact of climate change. Like, it really reduces biodiversity. So I was wondering, like, what your thoughts were on that, if that's, like, factored into all these um, charts that you've shown us so far. Yeah. So uh, biodiversity is obviously an important issue. Um, it's included in some of the models of, uh, of the cost of, of climate. Uh, again, what are the costs of, clim of, of losing biodiversity? In some sense, you could argue that because most of the uh, species that you're going to lose are species that didn't have much of an impact. Because if they had huge impact, they have huge uh, spread and probably wouldn't die out. Uh, and, and so the question is, how much are we willing to spend, for instance, on saving those? Uh, and then there's the whole question of exactly how many are we going to lose. There is estimates, and there, it's not a huge amount that we're talking about. So, you know, because it's included in the 4%, you know, we're talking about a very small part of that. The other part of the, of the issue is to recognize that the biggest challenge for biodiversity, that was also the, the outcome of the new biodiversity report that came out um, earlier this year, is not actually global warming. It's the fact that we are spending way too much space, so we're taking up space uh, from nature, uh, and that's to a very large extent because we have inefficient farming. Uh, what we see, for instance, in rich countries is because we are richer, because we farm much more effectively, we can start, for instance, reforesting. Uh, and and so it shows that, that, that the basic point that I try to make, that if you get richer, you often solve a lot of the uh, other environmental issues. Also, you stop worrying about you know, feeding your kids and you start you know, worrying about biodiversity. You know, if your kids are dying, you don't care all that much about critters, right? But if you're, if you're rich, you can actually afford to do so. Uh, so it's probably a long-term, much better outcome. The last thing I just want to say is, uh, while uh, this doesn't address biodiversity as such, uh, it's important to recognize that one of the unsung points of global warming is that we'll see much more uh, biomass in the world. So we, you know, you've probably heard about the greening of the earth. Uh, because CO2 is actually also a fertilizer for, for green stuff, uh, we estimate over the last 30 years or so, we've added about two continents of the US, of the continental US, uh, of green stuff to the world. We estimate that we might even get back by 2100 uh, to what we had in about 1500, so before you know, mankind basically started really cutting down forests. Uh, so we'll have a lot more green stuff simply because there'll be much more rain and much more fertilizer. So we'll have much more green stuff. Now, it may not all be the green stuff we want. So m some of it might be algae and other things we don't like. But it's important to recognize there's very, very little of this that's just one direction. Yep. Yes. Thank you for coming in today. I wanted to toss an idea your way and maybe see how you think about it. One of the reasons people are concerned about climate change as opposed to some of these other problems is that it has a timeline requirement built into it and in that the Earth's albedo will go down as temperature increases and snow melts, as well as permafrost will melt, releasing methane into the atmosphere. And so there's a concern of positive feedback loops being generated once we cross a certain threshold. So if we wait too long, it will be impossible to ever go backwards in time as opposed to some of these other issues which can lay dormant until we decide to act upon them. So I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, it, it, it's a very good question, and, and, and frankly, a lot of people wouldn't have you know, sort of dared to argue, argue that point. Uh, you know, some people end up saying a little bit, well, you know, poverty has always been with us, so you know, a few million people are going to die away. There you are. But we really worry about these tipping points. And that's, that's not totally un unreasonable, because in some way, you know, if the whole Earth was at, uh, at risk, that would be a much, much bigger catastrophe. Um, there, there's two parts to that answer. One is to say, well, certainly the current sort of alarmism doesn't seem to actually result in things or in policies that'll actually solve this problem. All we're doing is talking about it. So in, in, in some very real sense, uh, the, the alarmism that we're seeing right now has sort of the worst outcome of both worlds. It managed to waste a lot of money and not solve the problem. Um, so I would argue that it seems to me, and, and again, I'm, I'm a social scientist, I'm a political scientist, so uh, I, I read a lot of this, I, I talk to a lot of these guys, but I'm not a, a climate scientist. My understanding is that there's somewhat little, you know, we, we, don't, we don't believe this is a real risk or a, a big risk, but we can't rule it out. 
Uh, but that's true for almost everything if you look out to 2100. If you think about all the other challenges, you know, think about gray goo or uh, AI or you know, uh, rampant uh, uh, genetic terrorism or you know, all these kinds of other things or just you know, nuclear bombs, uh, it seems like there's a lot of things that could go wrong uh, by, by the end of the century. And so global warming is just one of these many things. So I think what we need to recognize is how do we deal with those threats generally? I think one of them is to make sure that we get rich. We know that if you're rich, you're much better able to deal with whatever the world throws at you, if it is bioterrorism or if it's any other kind of thing. Then you also need to have insurance policies. And one of the ways that we know we could do insurance uh, for climate is through geoengineering, you might have heard of. Uh, but basically, geoengineering is the idea of essentially putting sunshades on the planet, making it slightly cooler. We know that works because that's what volcanoes do. So if you've heard about Mount Pinatubo in 1991, it emitted a lot of CO2 into the uh, stratosphere uh, and, and, sorry, uh, sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere. So basically it spewed up a lot of sulfur dioxide. It put a little bit of a blanket around the world and we can actually measure for a couple of years, it made the world about half a degree cooler. We can obviously do that ourselves. It turns out that's not actually the most effective way. We could also make uh, marine clouds a little whiter, and I could get more into that, uh, uh, but I'm just you know, basically gonna throw it out there, amplifying a natural uh, uh, process. We estimate that we could avoid all of global warming in the 21st century for about $10 billion. Remember, that's sort of, you know, four orders of magnitude cheaper than what we're talking about here. It wouldn't solve everything. For instance, it wouldn't solve uh, ocean acidification, but it would solve a lot of things. I am not arguing we should do that right now because that we don't know whether it works. It, it, it boggles my mind that we have this problem that a lot of people say is the biggest problem in the world. And we don't even look at, you know, this very, very cheap thing, at least investigating if it would work. Uh, and we should certainly do that. And that would be probably one of the best sort of insurance policies. If something really starts going wrong, we could use geoengineering very quickly to make sure that it didn't go all that wrong or possibly even to rectify it. Uh, and, and we couldn't do that with sort of cutting off fossil fuels because even imagine, imagine if the world sort of realized, wow, you know, Greenland is gonna melt in the next 10 years. That's a totally unrealistic scenario, but let's just assume, you know, something really, really bad or the permafrost as you, was, you were mentioning. Would the world all, all come together and say, all right, kumbaya, we're, we're just gonna stop using fossil fuels? Of course we wouldn't, yeah. Everybody would say everyone else should do that, but, but not me, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, so, so we couldn't actually do that that way. That's why we should have that insurance policy. So richness and, and insurance policy. And then of course, the, the R&D, the green R&D that I'm talking about, I think is the only way that we're gonna get people to eventually shut off. Because if we make green energy cheaper than fossil fuels, we've solved the problem, everybody will switch. So the real issue here is it's an innovation problem. If you think back uh, uh, you know, to the 1860s, that's silly to say because nobody here can think back to the 1860s, but if you've heard about it, in the 1860s we hunted whales almost to extinction, right? Why? Because they have this oil that burns really, really brightly. So it lit up all of Western Europe and most of the US because it was really bright and it was really nice and it didn't have soot and all this stuff. It, you know, it was really inconvenient to go out in the middle of the ocean to hunt whales and oh yeah, all the whales died. But you know, I don't think they cared all that much back then. How do we solve that? It was not through the standard say, I'm sorry, could you please turn down your light so the whales can su survive? That, that wouldn't have worked, right? What did work was in Pennsylvania, we found oil and you realize, oh, that's, that's even better than whale oil and you don't have to go out in the middle of the ocean to kill these big beasts. You can just you know, drill it out of the ground. And so essentially the commercial interest in whaling dropped off the charts and that's probably what saved most whales. It was not because we tried to do good, it was because we had innovation that made for a better product somewhere else. And so I, I think this is really the answer to, you know, all those three are the answer to your question. Yep, yes, here, you. Hi, uh, thank you for coming. Um, so I think what you say about uh, innovation in green energy technologies is very interesting. Um, I agree that's, you know, a big, a big important part. Um, but you mentioned, you touched a little bit on uh, things like ocean acidification. And um, I mean, I, the, you made a note about how proportionality of numbers is often overemphasized. Um, how do you quantify, you know, 
the, the most minute differences can be the subtle knife that makes all the difference. So um, when you look at algal blooms or you look at um, how sensitive you know, bees are to pollination and therefore the entire food chain, how do you quantify the effect of small, small environmental damage that has far-reaching effects? Yeah, I, I mean, it's certainly true that if the world is such that we're on a knife edge, our models are gonna be very, very sensitive to whether we got it slightly wrong or not. But I would actually argue that it typically seems to be the exact opposite. So there's only one estimate of, of what's gonna be the impact on, on, on ocean acidification. And it shows that by the end of the century, the cost will probably be about 0.01% of GDP. Uh, and that's surprising in some sense, right? Because we've heard this is really, really terrible and all this stuff. But the thing you have to remember is that we know that we're increasingly switching from ocean fishing to fish farming. And fish farming is virtually robust to, sorry, Im imperv impervious to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to any, any sort of ocean acidification because everything is already regulated. Almost all factors are already regulated in fish farming. So it's not going to affect most of the fish catch. Now, it may actually have impacts on poorer populations that live off of the ocean, and, and so it would have some, some inequality uh, uh, impacts, but of course, that's one of the reasons why you should make sure that people get out of poverty. Uh, one of the things that drives me nuts when you talk about global warming uh, is, is the way that people say, we, you know, think of those poor farmers in Africa in 2100 who will actually see their yields go down we should cut carbon emissions so that they will have their yields go down slightly less. No, we should make sure those poor farmers in Africa are no longer farmers. They should be in cities and, you know, I don't know what, they, what you do in 2100, but you don't farm, right? And, and, and it's, a, it's a recipe to make sure that you're poor. We want to get people off the farm and into factories or into, you know, whatever you do in 2100 and, and be productive there. And, and it's the same thing for, you know, for fisheries and for pretty much any other thing. So again, you know, with bees, uh, there's definitely some concern about bees, but remember, if you actually look at the number of beehives in the world, they've increased dramatically. Why? Because there's a commercial interest in actually providing bees because they provide a, 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 a very crucial service of pollination, for instance, for almond pharma, pharmacy in California and pretty much else, elsewhere. So if you look at the FAO uh, website, they, they actually list the amount of beehives that we have in the world. They've kept increasing because there's a commercial interest in making sure that you have lots of beehives. It doesn't mean that there are no problems, but it does sort of indicate we hear this bee collapse and some of it is true but we fail to recognize that we have already very, very good mechanisms to deal with most of these issues. Okay, I'm realizing I'm being done. So now. if you want the, uh, the flies down here, thank you. Thank you. Right, thanks.